Evil Genius back with you once again, and for the last couple of weeks or so, it seems like the big thing that's been coming out of President Obama's mouth is the Buffett Rule. Buffett Rule, Buffett Rule, Buffett Rule. Uh, it's really been what he's been pushing in a lot of his speeches and so forth. Uh, he's been really framing it and talking about it in terms of uh, income inequality and in terms of, quote, fairness by his definition of the term. And so what I wanted to do today was to take some of these arguments that he and others on the left have in terms of the Buffett rule and look at them from an economic perspective, not from, a, not from an emotional perspective, not from a warm and fuzzy perspective like he's trying to do it, but from an actual economic perspective and ask some questions. Is income inequality really a bad thing economically? Does it even really exist economically? When it comes to doing things in particular for working Americans, does that make economic sense? Uh, when it comes to the Buffett rule itself, does that rule, in terms of taxation, would that make sense if, economically if it were implemented? That's what I wanted to talk about today. Now, I, I'm taping this on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday the 17th of April. Last night on Monday, the Buffett rule actually failed the Senate, so we will not see it come into play. But uh, you can rest assured that these arguments and these talking points that Obama has put forth, they will carry over through the rest of the campaign the presidential campaign. He's going to talk about this left and right. In fact, I would I would suspect that he will point to the failure of the Buffett rule uh, as a way to go after Republicans. I mean, everyone pretty much figured out that this was never going to pass, and, and I think Obama himself knew that. So uh, I think he may have been setting that up for a line of attack during the campaign. So I want to give you some economic truth, if you will, uh, to combat some of these arguments as you're going to hear them over the next few months. Now, you're hearing me say I'm going to talk about economics today. And that probably uh, frightens some of you or scares some of you. Don't worry. I'm not going to give you a bunch of charts and graphs. I'm not going to spend 20 minutes talking about guns and butters. You don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, but I'm going to talk about economics in a very basic and common sense sort of way. Because really, at the face of it, at the end of the day, economics really boils down to common sense. Now, I'm not a, a uh, doctorate in economics. I don't have any sort of uh, degrees in that topic. So what I wanted to do to give us a baseline, to give myself a baseline to work with, a resource to work with, is I consulted this book quite a bit in uh, preparing this presentation today. This is a book called Basic Economics. I'll get this out of the way of the computer here. Uh, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, who's one of the great economists and thinkers that we have in America. Uh, he, he's written a lot of books, not only about economics, but uh, also about history and, and, and uh, how, uh, different cultures have interacted with each other, each other. tremendously intelligent guy and, and someone whose uh, work you should really have on your bookshelf, particularly this, this book uh, in terms of economics. So that's kind of what I based a lot of this off of today and, and uh, the source I use for a lot of the material that we'll be talking about. First of all, let's talk about the idea of income inequality. Now you remember probably back in the fall, if you've been a long-term watcher of this show, I did a whole show on income inequality and how ridiculous that entire idea is. But I really didn't, uh, didn't approach it from an uh, economic perspective. I, I approached it back then more from a philosophical perspective. When you look at it from an economic perspective, you'll, you'll find a few different things that, that make this a little bit more interesting. First of all, does income inequality really exist? Is it really that big of a problem? I mean, you, you often will hear Obama or others on the left talk about how, oh, 5% of the population controls this huge amount of wealth or 5% get you know, the, this huge amount of the income. And they talk about that as though that is by default unfair or that it by default is an issue. But is that, are those numbers in and of themselves cause for concern? Well, I'm not sure that they are because it seems to me that such numbers are often misleading. There, there's a number of factors that don't seem to be taken into account. When you just look at a, a statistic that says on this given date, in this given year, 5% of the population controls however much of the income. There's a lot of factors that don't come into play with that. One of those factors is age. No one really ever talks about age when it comes to these type of topics. But let, let's think about this for a second. And I'm going to quote directly from Seoul here. Uh, it is not uncommon for most of the people in the top 5% of income earners to be 45 years old and up. Okay, well, when you actually think about that, that makes some sense, doesn't it? So you have all these kids out there in the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, talking about why it's unfair that they're not rich. No, it's not unfair. You're just out of college. You ought to be on the bottom of the ladder. You're just entering the workplace. And so it's often misleading that we characterize people as rich and poor 
in that aspect when really we should classify them more in terms of their age and and what experience they have and so forth again i'm going to quote directly from soul here although people in the top income brackets and the bottom income brackets the rich and the poor as they are often called may be discussed as if they were different classes of people often they are in fact the very same people at different stages of their lives three quarters of those Americans who were in the bottom 20% of income in 1975 were also in the top 40% at some point over the next 16 years. This is not surprising. After 16 years, people usually have, uh, have had 16 years more experience, perhaps including on the job training or formal education. Those in business or the professions have had 16 years in which to build up a clientele it would be surprising if they were not able to earn more money as a result. So there you see that not only is age a factor, but also that there is significant mobility through the income ladder. Something that Obama and all the left don't want you to, to think about. They want you to think that this 5% or 1% or whatever number they're gonna use, that this cabal of people at the tip top of the economic food chain that it's impenetrable, you can never get in and you can never get out. Well, bull, that just proved it. You see, when people talk about inequality, they don't often talk about the mobility that happens over long periods of time. Most of those stats don't take that into account. There have been really only very few studies that actually uh, followed people over the long term. There was a study from the University of Michigan back in the 1970s that did that, but very few others. And it illustrates just what we said there that there is mobility. So this idea of income inequality and the, the fact that you are on the low end of it is some sort of a trap, that's absolute hogwash. So let's just set that aside. But there is a bigger question here. Regardless of whether there is some sort of inequity in income, regardless of whether that actually exists or whether it does not exist, in either case, would addressing an issue of inequality in income actually also address the issue of how to better grow our economy? In other words, would a more equitable distribution of income lead necessarily to a better economy or not? Well, let's think about that. To, to, to start that discussion, let's talk about the basic definition of the term economics. Everybody talks about economics, but few people really ever define it. What's the definition of economics? Well, I, I think that a British economist named Lionel Robinson had probably the most functional definition. According to Lionel Robinson, economics is the study of scarce resources which have alternate uses. Well, that's a definition that Sowell certainly takes and expands upon in his works. Sowell goes on to show through this book and, and several others of his that the more efficient an economy is, which is to say that the more that scarce resources are directed towards their most optimal uses, the more efficient that an economy is, the more wealth is created, and therefore the higher of a standard living that results for that economy as a whole. Sol then goes on by comparing other uh, types of economies to free market economies. Sol illustrates that free market economies seem to do the best job of getting these scarce resources to their best uses. And the reason that happens is because in a free market, there's no one central authority that is tasked with the arduous job of figuring out all the proper prices and the proper uh, values of all of the billions of transactions that human beings undertake every day. It's impossible for human beings to do that. And if you go look at the Soviet Union and other socialist and communist economies over time, you'll find that they do a very poor job of that. It, it's impossible for human beings to do it. Instead, in a free market economy, fluctuations in price in response to changing supply and demand serves this function in a much more responsive and efficient manner. Now, I've given you a lot of information there, and let's face it, in the space of about a paragraph, I've tried to surmise a 650-page book, so I'm sure I did it at a service. I'm sure I'm just getting at the, the very tip-top, the very top-level, top-level explanation of this. But the bottom line is that in an efficient economy, scarce resources are going to go towards their best uses, their most optimal uses. Well, people are resources, too. When you think about it, people are resources. So if you're going to artificially make incomes more equal, if you're going to artificially play with who gets paid what, then by definition, you are going to force scarce resources, in this case people, you're going to force scarce resources to be used inefficiently. 
because you're going to force people to be given more money in this case, more income, than their contributions are actually worth on the free market. You're taking resources away from where they can potentially be used better and giving them towards people who do not contribute nearly as much. So really, in terms of growing an economy, trying to figure out a more equitable distribution of income is not a good way to go about it. It would almost be counterproductive in a lot of cases. So let's set that income inequality thing to the side. It's not really an important issue should not be viewed as an important issue. Another thing that you hear Obama and his ilk talk about a lot is, is working Americans and how we need to do something for working Americans. And they try to build this divide between working Americans and the wealthy. They infer, I mean, they never come out and say it, but they infer that only the middle class and only the poor are the ones that actually work. The rich don't actually work. Is that true? Well, not according to the Harvard Business Review. Uh, according to the Harvard Business Review, among the top 6% of income earners, 62% of them work more than 50 hours a week. 35% of them work more than 60 hours a week. And if you don't believe me, go try following your typical CEO around for a day out of his life and see how quickly you get exhausted. The wealthy work just as much or more than those in the middle class. So this idea that the middle class is just, they're the only ones who are working Americans or they are the American workers, that's absolute bull. The wealthy work just as much or more. But why is it so easy for us to get trapped in this idea of the middle class as the only working Americans? Well, that, that comes about because of an idea that Sowell talks about, it, and he phrases this as well as I've heard anyone phrase it. He calls it the mystique of labor. The mystique of labor, which is roughly defined as the idea that labor is the key or even the only factor in creating output. In other words, it's the idea that when, when you look at a particular object that you buy, let's say this, uh, this laptop computer here. When you look at this laptop computer and you think, well, you know, I got that computer, I purchased that computer, the value of that computer is mostly wrapped up in those people on the assembly line that put it together, and that guy in the factory that put it into a box, and that guy that drove the truck that, that, brought, it to the, uh, that brought it to the store where I bought it, that all of those comprise the value of the product. Is that actually true? I'm not sure that it is. Now, granted, that labor that we talked about, that, that does certainly have a degree and a factor in the overall value of the product, but it doesn't explain the whole thing. What about those who invested in the factory where the computer was produced? Those that invest in the machinery that produced the computer. Those that early on invested in the company that had to develop the computer. Did they not also contribute? Did they not also provide value? I should say they did. And in a lot of ways, those people who aren't considered labor, those people contributed more in terms of value. Why? Because they are the ones that took the risks necessary to produce this computer. You see, when you talk about labor, you talk about that person that's on the assembly line or driving the truck or whatever, and, and, and I'm not downgrading them, but you've got to understand that they they take on very little risk in terms of the production of the product. You know, if I'm on an assembly line, if I'm working in a factory, and I work 40 hours a week, then I'm going to get paid for that 40 hours no matter what. I'm going to get paid whether you sell a computer or not. I'm going to get paid that 40 hours whether the company turns a profit or not. Now, granted, over the long term, I can lose that job if you're not selling computers. But at the end of the day, if I turn my 40 hours in of work, you're required to pay me. But those investors, the people that invested in the company, invested in the, the, the factory, invested in the machinery, those people are not guaranteed a return on their investment. The labor is guaranteed a return on their investment. They're going to get paid for their work. But the investor is not. So therefore, they're taking on much more of the risk in producing this computer. Therefore, their contributions, in a lot of ways, are a little bit more valuable. You see, the mystique of labor does not take into account things like capital, management, natural resources, among other things. All of those things that contribute to the output. And this goes to the idea of risk and capital gains. You see, when we talk about the Buffett rule, what are we actually talking about? When they say that Warren Buffett pays less on his income than his secretary pays on hers, what are they actually talking about? Well, there are two different types of income. 
Warren Buffett, most of his income comes from investments, from investing in factories and companies and so forth that produce these computers and whatever else. His secretary's uh, contributions come in the form of labor for which she has virtually no risk, for which she is guaranteed payment no matter what happens. Now, when we talk about something like the Buffett rule, the key mistake that we are making, the key mistake that Barack Obama is making, is that he is not separating out these different types of incomes. That he is, in effect, valuing Warren Buffett's contributions the same way that he's valuing his secretary's contributions. When, in fact, Buffett's contributions are much more important in terms of the economy. What Obama's doing is that he's equating the speculative investment of someone like Buffett to the labor investment of someone as a secretary. He's essentially making the case that both are equal in terms of, of their contribution to the economy and, and, and one is not more important than the other. That's absolute bull. You see, the reason that we have such a discrepancy in terms of Warren Buffett's income versus that of a secretary is because capital gains taxes are lower because we want to encourage investment. Because without investment, you can't have computers. You can't have jobs. You can't have any of this standard of living that we've grown accustomed to. So therefore, a Buffett rule, which would effectively, if it were implemented, which would effectively raise capital gains taxes, or at least tax that income in a way similar to how other types of income are, are taxed, such a rule would be counterproductive to growing the economy because you would make it more difficult to get a return on your investment. You would force, them, force those who are taking the highest amount of risk already to take even more risk before they could get a return on investment. Well, what would they do? Would they continue to invest? A lot of them wouldn't. Or they'd want to go for the more sure investments at the very least. You wouldn't have nearly as much speculation. And that speculation, while well, some people call it a dirty word, that speculation leads to the computers and leads to the flat screen televisions and leads to all the things that we buy and that we purchase and that create jobs for us. A Buffett rule would have negative effects on job creation and economic growth any way you slice it. It might make a few people feel better about their personal situation in the short term, but they won't feel better when all the jobs are gone, all the factories are closed, and you can't find work. At the end of the day, investment is the key to our economy. We need to encourage investment, not discourage it. We don't need to raise the capital gains tax. We need to lower it. We need to make it zero, especially when you consider that our corporate tax rate in this country is now the highest in the world. And you want to put more taxes on top of that? And you want to create jobs? How do you do that? You can't. You can't. Sorry, Barack. Either you don't understand economics or you're just trying to use this false narrative of so-called fairness as a way to get those people who don't understand economics behind you in your election. That's all you care about. The Buffett rule is dead, and thank God. The Senate did the right thing. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.